Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. Hello, welcome to The Long Road. My name is um, Chris Roberts, and um, to be up front, today we're going to talk about the um, PACT Act and how it um, affects veterans, families, widows, and um, the presentation I have, and it's in a PowerPoint, it's a presentation that the VA gave to a number of organizations and veteran service officers on how to um, help veterans and what the PAC Act was, was going to cover. Hopefully, I will be able to get everything done within this hour. If not, we'll just continue it to the next show because I feel this is an extremely important and this information needs to to get out um, because a lot of this information also pertains to some of the veterans are 70, 80 plus years old. Um, people forget how long ago Vietnam War was. It was this is the 50th anniversary of the um, the Viet of Vietnam, and um, that's that's a long time ago. And what I'm, I don't like to read word for word from the PowerPoint, but in this case, I'll be reading more than um, what I would normally do because, um, again, is to emphasize the, um, the importance of the PACT Act. Also, stay up front. I even thought I have a VA.gov email. I do not work for the VA. I work to help veterans, so every veteran that, or widow that comes to see me, my priority is their quality of life, and my responsibility is to get them as many, if not all, the benefits that they deserve and they um, rate. And one of the things that I, I want to say right up front that I've heard over and over again. <clears throat> you, I hear veterans saying, well, I didn't apply for a disability because I did not want to take money away from people that were more deserving. If you have a service-connected disability, the VA will not take any money away from another deserving um, veteran. VA disability is mandatory funding. If more veterans have service-connected um, disabilities, the federal government has to put more money into the dif disability part of the um, VA budget. So get that out of your head. When you apply, think of applying for a VA disability you are not competing against other veterans or veterans that you think are worse off than you, okay? You are responsible for taking care of yourself and taking care of your family. The VA will never put a claim in for you. You have to put the claim in and you have to tell the VA what you are claiming for a disability. That's the difference from working for the VA. And when you work for the VA and they come in and say, what's wrong with you? And you tell them what's wrong with you. They put it on the claim form and they send it in. If you put it the wrong way, if you forget to say something is secondary 
or if something was aggravated by military service, you run the risk of um, a high risk of both those situations of a qualified injury getting um, denied. So, and the second part, which is really bad, and this goes for the, um, this is for the wives of veterans. <clears throat> Far too many veterans have said to their wives, don't worry about it, everything is taken care of. Don't worry about it, everything is taken care of. So the wife doesn't ask and the veteran doesn't tell the, um, the wife. And so what happens, the veteran dies, then all of a sudden whatever benefits that the veteran was getting from the VA, they all stop. And if someone had done, done 20 years or more and <clears throat> they did not um, sign up for survivor's benefit plan back when before the wife had to be notified, then the retirement also disappears. One of the things with the survival benefit plan under the PACT Act, um, if you've been your 20 years and you're married, there is a window, a one-year window for the veteran to sign up under the survivor's benefit plan and help take care of your, your wife if something happens to you. I have the survivor's benefit plan you pay 360 payments. Once you pay 360 payments and you're more than older than 70 years old, you don't have to pay anymore, but your wife um, or surviving individual that you have gets 55%, in my case, 55% of the, the veterans and retirement check. I think there's three levels, 25, 35, 55, and again, they all cost. And so it's really important that the veteran um, sits down and explains a lot of things to their, um, their wife or their spouse. And what I'm doing now, we're, I know it's morbid and stuff like that, but we're getting all the paperwork and everything to together. So if a veteran passes and the veteran is service connected, this is what the wife has to do, just fill a few extra areas and then they can apply for a service connected um, death. They can help apply for a $2,000 reimbursement on funeral expenses. But um, unfortunately, a lot of um, widows will not know that. And if they go to 10 years and before someone says, wow, you could have applied for um, Service Connected. You're not going to get 10 years of back pay. Oh, you know you could have applied for um, up to $2,000 in funeral expense costs. And they go, oh, nope, you only had a two-year window to do that. So again, and wives, ask your husband if he says, ah, don't worry about it. everything um, is taken care of, take that as a warning sign to ask. You know, when I tell my daughters that, hey, when I was growing up, women couldn't have credit cards unless the husband authorized the credit cards. And they go, ah, oh, no way, Dad, no way, Dad. Um, for a lot of um, you women right now who are um, wives of um, Vietnam veterans and everything, you know what it was like growing up and trying to get a woman to, as a woman, trying to get a credit card or buy things on your own. So... Unfortunately, some of the guys that um, of these veterans, 
you know, born in the late 40s, they still have that old mindset. And um, it's for your well-being to ensure that you and the veterans sit down and have a really deep, compre comprehensive talk on what would be happening if the veteran who's is retired or the veteran's collecting disability, what happens to you when the veteran passes? Okay, going to the PACT Act, Congress always likes to um, come up with these fancy names. The PACT Act is the promise to address comprehensive toxin acts and toxin exposure risk TERA overview of the veteran. This is a veteran um, overview for the veteran service officers and organizations, but it's also important for you, the veteran, to understand. Okay, the PACT Act was um, passed in August 12th of um, 2022. It was signed in honor of Fer Sergeant First Class Heath Robinson, who died of lung cancer at the age of 39, oh, it was August 10th instead. As effective August 10th, the act added 20 plus presumptive conditions for the Gulf War and post 9-11 veterans, okay? Because of the burn pits and all of that, these 20 conditions, which we'll go over later, if you have any of these 20 conditions, you do not have to prove this service connected. The VA must grant you service connected for these um, conditions. The only question is under these conditions is how disabling are these, are, are any of these um, conditions. Also for Vietnam era veterans, for the longest time, people serving in Thailand and Laos, Cambodia, and some of these other places in Southwest Asia, they weren't Southeast Asia. They were told over and over, you were never um, exposed to um, Agent Orange or any herbicide. And so their claims were, the vast majority of their claims were denied. Then uh, a few years back, they said, well, you know, we did spray Agent Orange on the perimeter. So if you were in the Air Force and you were a security guard and you came one of these um, Agent Orange um, presumptive diseases and you could prove that you were a security guard, say, in Yubon, um, Thailand, we would say you were exposed to Agent Orange. But... If you lived in barracks right on the other side of the road, um, you were not exposed to Agent Orange. If you had one of the um, housekeepers wash all your clothes in water, quote unquote, that would have Agent Orange runoff, you were not considered Agent Orange. And so, Quite a few veterans who served in Thailand were denied, 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 and quite a few of those veterans who have been denied have now died. And so there's a way we can um, work on some of those. Also, there was a lot of veterans that were exposed to ionized radiation. And with their exposure to ionized radiation, again, um, some of the, um, <clears throat> the testing sites that they did out in the um, Pacific Ocean, sometimes putting sailors on the ships while they set off different nuclear warheads, atomic warheads, to see the effect that it would have on the ships and um, people. Now, again, they um, expanded that list. Again, unfortunately, a lot of people that would qualify are no longer 
with us. Okay, we don't have to worry about that one. <clears throat> okay, the, um, the PACT Act, this is the largest expansion of VA benefits in VA history and will impact millions of veterans. Basically, this, the PACT Act will, part of it, will, if, will expand VA presumptive illnesses and injuries back to Operation Desert Shield and for Southwest Asia and a number of other places all the way going forward. And, um, and so when you look at the number of people that went to the first Gulf War for Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and the ones from the evasion to Iraq all the way up to the withdrawal in Afghanistan, all those people who served in there will be covered. Again, you know, when you look at the um, first Gulf War, the first Gulf War was 33 years ago. And if you look at someone 18, so the youngest person that served in the first Gulf War was 51 years old. So now a lot of people, <coughs> excuse me, who served in the first Gulf War, and they're, now they're in their 60s and 70s. Okay, applying for the PACT Act, what happened was Congress rushed through the PACT Act because they wanted to get it in before the election so they can um, take credit. Nothing that Congress does for veterans is really out of the goodness of their heart. Basically, it's how will this affect my ability to get reelected? Okay, even though people and I filed claims in, um, in August, and as early as August and September, because when Congress passed the, the PACT Act, just because Congress passes an act or and the president signs it into law, then it has to go through a public care, a public notice, like 15 days for people to make comments back and forth. Then the rules people have to write it up. They have to codify it in um, law. Then um, they con um, the VA had to wait until Congress authorize the money. It's so, oh, hey buddy, you know, this is it. Oh, these in illnesses are, are covered. Oh, we did not authorize any money to pay for these illnesses. So because of that, the, um, the PACT Act, unless you were dying or, you know, really dying or significant financial problem like you get ready to throw out get thrown out of your house the bill collectors are at you the VA did not decide any of the PACT Act cases until basically January 19th of this year and um, which is starting to move um, pretty quick and so, like they said, between um, August 10th and January 1st of this year, there was well over 200,000 claims. But again, what Congress and other people sometimes forget to do is they go out and say, yep, here it is, okay? PACT Act claims are going to be totally different than other claims. You have one group of people filing for the first time. Those are kind of pretty easy. There's a standard claim form. If you had filed before and you were denied, 
then you have to go a supplemental claim form which requires new information. In this case, the new information would be the fact that um, Congress changed the law, okay? Then um, you, not only do you have to file that claim, then you would have to come up with all your doctors and everything so we could go in and get the medical release forms. Other part was, 200,000 new claims in um, September, four-month period. Uh, where are we going to get the people from? So Congress passed the um, PACT Act, and then the VA says, holy crap, we got to go out and hire a lot of people to process these claims and make decisions on these claims. Well, like I said, the complexity of claims processing has increased dramatically over a short period of time with the amount of time allotted to each claim remaining the same. So right now the VA is averaging 103 days per claim and it's saying, oh, we got all these new claims, a lot of them have gone back, a lot of them we don't even have information on, people never even filed, but we still have to get it done in a short period of time. You know how the pressure is, the, um, the number crunchers and stuff. Well, what, what's happening is because of you got a lot of new people, there's a checklist. And people go, hmm, you didn't do this. Um, like, for example, we'll go, hey, we don't have your medical and your, and your service record book. And so because we don't have that, it can no longer go under f fully developed claim, which the goal is 125 days, and it goes under the regular claim or the legacy claim process that could easily take 12 to 18 months. I can't tell you how many times over the past year that I've had to go into the veteran's VA file, benefit management system file, download what the VA said they don't have print it out, and then reload it to show the VA that they have it. Or, for, oh, we don't have your DD-214. Well, some veterans may, may have 200 um, different pieces of paper or forms in their file. A lot of the new people oh, don't have it. Well, they're not taking the time to go through the veteran's complete file before they go and say, hey, not here. Because if you put, if I'm an individual, I've got your um, paperwork, and I go and say, oh, don't have this, don't have this, send you out a letter and saying it's missing, I stamp it, and I put it back into the bin again. I'm done, it's not affecting my time. And so that's gonna be a frustrating part with the, um, the PAC Act. For um, mostly all the veterans, and um, there's been a form, a lot of times the VA has been sending it directly to the the veteran's home in a letter, and it's called, it's the, um, basically called the 11119 form, okay? Basically, it's coming from the Department of Defense. Department of Defense is letting the VA know all the veterans or current service members who served in an area that falls under the PACT Act. So I served in, in the Gulf War, 
Um, about a month and a half ago, I got my little postcard that says, 1119, Mr. Roberts, this is proof that you uh, qualified for this. And then what that once that goes out to you, that will go into the Veterans VA Benefit Management System file. And so under the old way is every time a veteran um, says, hey, I served in Vietnam and I got diabetes and I have a heart condition. So you submit the claim, then the VA would send the letter to a joint, it's a, I can't remember all the letters, and your claim sat there until they got the VA got the letter from the government DOD saying, yes, Mr. Roberts served in Vietnam. Okay, if it took two months, you think sat there for two months. The VA would not start any process whatsoever. Because, hey, but I got a Vietnam service medal. I got three campaign, uh, I got a campaign ribbon and stars. Um, I got a combat action medal. But until you have, uh, until they get the, no uh, the notification from really from the Department of Defense um, Department that you actually served in Vietnam, nothing moved. So this, in this way, the 1119 is so much better because if you file someone under the PACT Act, all the individual goes and looks. He says, oh, yes, Mr. Roberts has the 1119. Okay, we don't have to contact anybody with no delays. We should stop processing his right now. We should be going in looking to set up the appointments for his comp and pen exam. Okay. The um, article, you know, U.S. Art, chapter 38, U.S. 31138, that's for the TERA. That sets up how exams will be... Um, authorized for those ionized radiation and those other ones. And so the part, if you look at ionized radiation, some of the other ones, say you were taking part in atomic um, nuclear testing um, in 1946, so you're 18. So that means you would have been born in 28. To make you, if you if you're born in 28, you're 16, and you're 18 years old in 1946. So basically, 95 and above. So basically, the veterans that would fall in that category about 90 to 95 um, years old. Congress has a really bad habit of adding things on to um, the list as um, ve a lot of veterans have um, died off and it's going to cost them a um, little, little bit money, not that much money at all. That's just like when Congress passed the one the, for Camp Lejeune, and it came out, the Congressional Budget Office says, this will cost a little bit more than $6 billion. They had planned it all out, looked at that. Okay, under the 1119, covered veteran includes any veteran who served after August 2nd, 1990, performed service in, above, around Bahrain, Iraq, Kuwait, Omar, Gutter, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, UA, UAE, or after 9-11 performed active military service above, around Afghanistan, Dubai, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Lebanon, Uzbekistan, or any country determined by the secretary. 
which can still be expanded by the Secretary of Defense. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. I forgot to um, move the slides. Okay. Yes, people are going to be asked, what is um, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, um, Yemen, or Saudi Arabia, or Somalia, or Oman? Well, they wanted to cover a lot of people. There's still a lot of people in these areas would not expose the burn pits and um but there go on so that would be part of the um the frustration wait a minute i had to wait this long or i've had friends that died or friends that really had were disabled and stuff from it and now we got people like yemen what is Yemen on? Because we weren't supposed to have anybody in um, Yemen. But, or Dubai, or Egypt, or Jordan. What did they have to do with um, burn pits and everything? Then the, sec the secretary shall establish a list that contains an identification of one or more substances and chemicals Airborne Hazard, as the Secretary, in collaboration with the Secretary of Defense, list of toxin is expandable. And begin in two, not less than two years after the date of enactment of the um, promise to address comprehensive tactic act, and not less frequency than one every two years. Therefore, the Secretary should shall submit to the Committee on Veterans Affairs of the Senate and Committee on Veterans Affairs of the House a report identifying any additional or removal to the list under paragraph two. Okay, that sounds really good, but that happens um, every two years anyway with Agent Orange and stuff. And basically, the scientific research comes out every two years, and they figure this is going to be covered, or there's not enough evidence to show. Um, give you, for an example, if we go to Camp Lejeune, you can go and say, well, yeah, Camp Lejeune costs water, costs prostate cancer. But when they compare prostate cancer for an individual 75 years old and they compare prostate cancer for an individual with 75 years old and served at Camp Lejeune during the water period, the percentages are almost identical, so that number doesn't go on. But when you compare prostate cancer for a 45-year-old individual, and then you compare it to a 45 individual who was at Camp Lejeune, the Camp Lejeune number is higher. Just like male breast cancer. If you served at Camp Lejeune, you have a much higher number than you did not serve at um, Camp Lejeune. Okay. This is, um, okay, <clears throat> one of the VA, before I start the list, the VA requires what's called a nexus, okay? You have to show the VA an event, okay? Like you jump off an Amtrak and you break your leg, or you... You're running and you twist your knee in the sand and rip your knee apart. Those would be in your medical record. Those would be a nexus. So, say you put a claim in, knee damage, unstable knee due to such an injury. 
then you would go in and say hip pain, hip constant hip sprain, and lower back pain, those would be secondary to the knee because you would not have anything in your record book that would show that you had an incident that result in a back injury or a hip injury. But the thing goes, if you had not ripped your knee apart, you would have been walking straight and you would not have had the hip injury or the lower back pain and strain. Okay, when you have a presumptive illness, okay, like Viet in um, Vietnam, diabetes, intimate heart disease, okay? You do not have to have a nexus statement because it's presumptive. If you had a foot on the ground and now flying over, you, that, constant, that wipes out the need for the nexus statement. And so this is why it's important. Okay, here are the, um, the new ones that come under presumptive conditions currently for covered veterans. Asthma diagnosed after service, okay? It's pretty tough to diagnose um, asthma. They used to say, well, did you have asthma with one year? Um, getting out of the um, service, uh, nope, you can't prove it is, okay? Now, if you have asthma, if you're 60 years old and you have asthma and you have a 1119, it's service-connected. And again, you will get an exam and then you will have to supply your, your medical prior medical records if they're at all the VA. Your only treatment was at the VA. Piece of cake. If not, you got to go and put uh, medical release forms for the VA to get those records. Added on now, brain cancer. <clears throat> um, chronic bronchitis. You know, some people get bronchitis. Well, I get keep getting it. I keep getting it. Again, now you don't have to prove it's service-connected. COPD is now service-connected. It's been added on. Okay. For example, when I got retired from the service, I had COPD and I had asthma. I worked in some places, you know, that weren't very healthy to me. I worked around heavy equipment, sucking in a lot of the um, diesel fuel, the particulars, the unburned, you know, the things you burn in the fires and everything. So now, but <clears throat> it doesn't do me any good to apply for them because I'm not going to get... Um, any um, increase, but, you know, if you served in the Gulf War, you know, <clears throat> 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, and you have asthma, or you have COPD, you now have a very legitimate claim to file for Service Connected. If you don't file, it's shame on you because they're important. Okay, chronic rhinitis and cyanitis, the, um, the, the two nose part things, they're covered. Emphysema is covered. And this one, for the longest time, emphysema wasn't covered. The reason emphysema wasn't covered was because 
One of the leading causes of emphysema was smoking. And this, the, um, the tobacco companies had gotten with the senators and Congress and everything, and they made ensured that smoking was not a service-connected disability. Things related to smoking were not service-connected disabilities because in sea rats and other food packages, there used to be little packages of three cigarettes each. And so you would think, it's like, oh man, these veterans are putting the claim in because I never smoked until I went to Korea. I never smoked until I went to Vietnam and I had these things in here and I picked it up and so basically it was the tobacco um, company's um, attempt to um, get um, the young soldiers hooked on um, cigarette smoking. <clears throat> so gastrointestinal cancer of any type, head cancer of any type, um, respiratory cancer of any type, reproduction cancer of any um, type. The one I had filed the claim for um, an individual who went there and um, he had prostate cancer. Well, prostate cancer is re reproductive because for us guys, if you don't have a prostate, you can't reproduce. So I'm testing falling under there. Pancreatic cancer, neck cancer, melanoma. Again, being in the Southwest gradually, um, greatly increases your, um, your risk of melanoma. The, this type of lung disease that I don't know of, kidney cancer, lymphatic cancer of any type, lymphoma of any type, um, scarinosis, S-A-R-C-O-I-D-O-S-I-S, uh, -I -I um, of any um, type. So there's a lot of issues um, on here, okay? And what is kind of a beneficial, when I have veterans that come to me and I say, how you doing? I'm, oh, I'm doing okay. First I have to ask them, what's okay? And I get to make some pains and stuff. Second, are you a doctor? Mm, nope. Are you a statistical person? Mm, nope. No, there's no statistical person. And so, just because you're 70 years old and you have aches and pains and, and all those kind of stuff, you as the veteran, it's not your responsibility to say, oh, that's just normal wear and tear. Um, yeah, you know, there's people in better shape than me. And I go, no, let's do it. When we go and apply for a claim for the VA, you went into the service at 100%, plain and simple, you got injured or you got beat up and say you have arthritis in the knee. Can you, as the layperson, say that your arthritis in the knee would be the same extent if you never went into service? And the answer is no. Your arthritis in the knee may have started for those long marches, carrying a lot of weight, all those could have started your arthritis and your arthritis developed at a much quicker rate 
than a person that's normal wear and tear. I can't tell you how many people that come in and they go, well, wait until you're my age and you see how it fits, how you feel and everything. And I'm filling out the paperwork and I'm going to myself is, I've already been your age and um, I'm not going to say that to them, but Okay, we're almost out of time, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover one more page, and then um, next week um, I'll pick up from there. Okay, medical nexus exams for toxic exposure risk. If a veteran submits to the secretary a claim, Forget about the secretary. You submit it to the VA. Claim for compensation for a service-connected disability under Section 1110 of this title with evidence of a disability and evidence of participating in a toxic exposure risk activity during military service, Navy, Air, or Space Service as evidenced by the memo and supported by the individual longitude exposure record. And such evidence is not significant to establish a service connection for the disability. The veteran, the secretary shall provide the veteran a medical examination under section 5103 and then obtain a medical opinion to be requested by the VA in conjunction with the medical examination as to whether it's like, at least likely as not that there is a nexus between the disability and the toxic exposure risk. This is to establish service connection on a direct basis. For some. Okay, what this also covers for the longest time, a lot of people in the Air Force, um, <clears throat> worked in missile silos out in the Midwest and everything. The missile silos gave off a, a lot of um, radiation. Also, I've had a couple of claims for people that worked on nuclear submarines. And if you go in their medical record and it keeps track of how much radiation, rads, and everything that they were exposed to. Okay. So, again, there's a statistical person, like you say, oh, yeah. The average family in the United States has 2.5 kids. I'd hate to be the half a kid, but that's statistical. So, what can... Giving an example, I don't know if I said it before, my wife, two of my three daughters, and eight of my grandchildren have had COVID. Some of them have had COVID a couple of times. Myself and my granddaughter have never had COVID even thought we were exposed to family members with COVID and all this other stuff, we didn't get it because individuals have different risk back. Okay. And so, you know, that's what happens. So you can't say statistically, I may get, say, 100 rads of radiation nothing can happen. Someone could get 50 rads of radiation and have a serious reaction, change in DNA and things like that. So that's why you're going to get the examination and that's why it can go out to another doctor. And if you don't agree with the VA's doctor, you can still go out and get that information from your own doctor or some other um, research.
And so, like I said, there's a lot under the PACT Act. I don't want to rush it all and get it in in a, a few minutes. Um, I'll tell you one thing. VA Medical Center up at White River Junction, they have a burn pit registry. If you get the opportunity, go up to the burn pit registration at the hospital at White River Junction. They'll sit down. They'll ask you a lot of questions. And depending on the answers that you give them, they will be proactive and they will set up exams for you. I've already got a couple of veterans who are getting um, lung MRIs, lung CAT scan. No, they're getting lung um, CAT scans, and one is getting a brain MRI because based on the conditions they had and what they've said to the burn, into the burn registry, or they go, yes, you've had asthma for a while, you have COPD, that's what they're doing. Like I said, White River Junction is extremely proactive. Also, you know, there's an um, email number that keeps popping up at an email address. If you have never ever applied to use the VA healthcare um, system, email me and we'll get you start going, getting enrolled in the VA healthcare system. And you do not have to be a disabled vet to use the VA healthcare system. There is a money restriction to get into it, but basically if you're over 65 and you're collecting social security, there's a really good chance you you and your spouse will fall under the um, the limit to qualify for um, to get enrolled into the service, and so I think it's you know what there's there's a lot of benefits getting into the VA system, the VA Medical Center at White River Junction, its satellite office in Keene, New Hampshire satellite offers in um, Brattleboro, Vermont, do a lot of great things. For people who, um, you can get rolled in the system and the VA has a, a really good optometry um, shop that's available for people. Secondly, for, for hearing aids, there is, you don't have to be service connected to get hearing aids from the VA. And the VA hearing aids are not the cheap $99 or $300 hearing aids. They have some really good hearing aids and you can even um, get hearing aids that you can control right by your, your phone. And bang, bang, going in, going out. So there is a lot that, um, that can be done for you once you get into the VA healthcare system. Normally, um, if we need to apply, basically, it takes about 15 minutes. We can fill out the forms, mail them in, ask for an appointment. Once you get approved, the VA will call you up to set you up with an appointment. And one of the things on the form is, where would you like to have your appointment? If you, for example, live in the Keene or the surrounding area, and you would rather go to the Manchester VA, you, you just put down Manchester VA and um, bingo. That's when they'll set up your first appointment. If you live in New Hampshire, Say you live in Keene and you get enrolled in the VA, people in New Hampshire can get community care. So you can see your primary care individual once a year and then go and say, oh, you need to see a cardiologist. 
And so instead of having you drive all the way up to White River Junction, well, we can send you to Cheshire Medical to see a cardiologist or a neurologist. Nope, if you don't want to drive all the way up there, bingo. And you can go, hey, does it mean I get to see the same cardiologist or neurologist I'm seeing right now? Yes, you can, because Cheshire Medical accepts um, community care. So there are a lot of benefits getting into the VA healthcare system. And I can tell you about half the people who use the VA healthcare system have no service connected condition at all. And so the VA, like I said, the VA in White River Junction wants to help you, wants to treat you, wants to improve your quality of life. And so get off your butt, find out how the VA can help you. And if you try and you're not getting the right um, answers or you're getting the blow off, Justin, come and see me and I'll help you navigate through the system. As any organization, every organization has some really great employees. Some organizations have more than others. And other, every organization has employees that as soon as they check in at 8 o'clock in the morning, they start looking at the clock and can't wait until 4 o'clock comes along. And unfortunately, that happens. And so that is, I'm going to wrap it up for um, this week. Next week, we'll do the second part of the PAC Act. And if I have time, I'll bring some claim forms in and we'll start. I will give you an example what we have to do and what information is needed to um, stop putting a claim in for the PACT Act. And so thank you for listening. And I hope hopefully what I've done has been informative and um helpful to you. And so be safe, enjoy spring, and I shall see you next week.